Welcome to the Bible Made Clear. So as we have been walking through Colossians, and as you can see up on the screen above me here, um, we have uh, Esort up, and we've been going through that. And um, so just kind of picking through some of the uh, word definitions, the grammar, um, commentaries, <clears throat> anything that will be uh, really of a value to us. So uh, before we go on, so I don't forget, um, please hit subscribe or like, uh, whatever, for uh, the channel. That way, um, it uh, I guess it moves up a bit. So uh, either way, that's good for the channel. And um, so today, we're going to start with verse 5. We had gone through Colossians 3, 1 to 4 uh, last time. So we're going to jump right in uh, at verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, uh, which is idolatry. So uh, we want to actually kind of um, um, realize that when Paul uses therefore, the word therefore, um, you know, the old saying is you get to see what it's there for. But <clears throat> we want to make sure that we understand that this is the transition in Paul's epistles from the doctrinal uh, to the practical. So uh, like in um, Ephesians, he'll go through three chapters. He hits chapter four and he'll say, therefore, right? So now he's going to, in other words, therefore, based on what we know, based on uh, the truth of the doctrine that has been just revealed now, this is how we actually put it into practice. This is how we uh, put it into shoe leather, how we walk, how we live. This is what affects our behavior. Y your behavior is always, always 100% affected by what you believe. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you can look, look out anywhere in the world and, um, you know, people live based on their beliefs. Um, if I you know, if I believe that I could uh, work my way to heaven, then I'm going to do certain works to try to get there. Uh, if I need, if I believe that I needed to go to church, if I was in a group that said, you get to go to church every single day and never miss a day, otherwise you, you can't go to heaven. Well, uh, if I believe that was true, then I would be there every day if I wanted to go to heaven. Um, so th there's, um, there's so many misconceptions, but our beliefs uh, really are the source of our behavior, how we live, um, what we do. It affects our will. So we've just learned over the past number of videos from chapter one um, what Paul has been dealing with here. And now certainly he's been dealing with um, the Colossian church in relation to Gnosticism. We uh, tried to put that into some practical um uh, constructs, how we may look at that today because of the problems that the Gnostics brought to the table. Uh, they believed you needed to have a special knowledge. They were legalistic. They were mystic. They were ascetic. Uh, we looked at that in chapter two. Um, and, and they followed the philosophy of the world. Um, there is good philosophy and there's bad philosophy. Um, you know, philosophy is uh, technically it's just the love of wisdom. In other words, if we want to make philosophy practical, you think about it as reasoning something out to come to a conclusion so you can then apply it. And, um, you know, the easiest way to think of it is um, knowledge provides information and wisdom provides um, the proper application of that knowledge. And so. Uh, here, we've learned a lot up and through verse 4. Uh, usually, they had constructed the chapter breaks so that therefore is at the beginning of a chapter, like Romans, right? You go through Romans 1 through 11, and then in chapter 12, Paul says, therefore, right? In other words, uh, therefore, because we have learned all of this, in other words, this is how we present ourselves uh, to God, right? A living and holy sacrifice. So, um, that's uh, acceptable to God, right? It's our logical or reasonable service. 
So that's in Romans. So here, <clears throat> what Paul does is he first of all jumps into the negative on the therefore, because he wants to move into the positive, obviously. Now, let me um, put up here Vines. We've looked at him from time to time. The reason, you know, and it's unfortunate this book is out of print, but, um, you know, from time to time, what um, what Vines will do for us is he will actually uh, provide some pretty good insight, not only into word definitions, because he's the one, uh, W.E. Vine, he's the one that wrote the uh, Theological Dictionary of New Testament, uh, and he did some Old Testament words. So um, he gives us the grammar. I, I just think he's, um, he's pretty insightful on most things. So here, uh, notice he'll talk about um, and this is in his book here on Colossians, um, and it's verses 5 to 11. So under the introduction, he says this forms the first section of the whole division. Now, the whole division is just essentially the rest of chapter 3, uh, which gives instruction to practical duties, right? Uh, this part, verses 5 to 11, uh, is, so to speak, uh, negative in that it teaches what is to be put to death, uh, what is to be put away, and from what we are to abstain. That's pretty clear, right? When we read the verse, what verse says, he says the next section, 12 to 17, gives instruction as to how to act, uh, having shown that the present hidden life is yet to be manifested, the apostle lays it down that these facts, present and future, are to have an effect in the daily life. Uh, the members, which are instruments of sin, are to be put to death in this respect. And then he lists some here. He says, um, uh, uh, immoral acts and evil desires uh, are idolatry, verse 5. They bring the wrath of God upon the ungodly, verse 6. They, uh, they had characterized the unregenerate state of believers, verse 7. Um, but all that marked the nature of the old man, which is the former self. It's not your father. Um, and that's verses 8 and 9. So the new man um, <clears throat> has put on and is maintained and developed in increasing knowledge according to the standard of God's image in which there is there are no natural distinctions, but Christ is all in all. So... This is how he moves from basically from verse 5 to 11. But right now, our main concern um, is just, you know, starting out at verse 5. And let me pop uh, Esword back up there. So in, um, in verse 5, right, therefore, here's the practical, right? Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication. Now, as we look at these words, uh, let's run through a quick list and definition. So here, um, Constable gives a quick list, right? Um, fornication is really um, translated immorality, right? Fornication is um, any, any kind of sex outside of marriage because marriage is the domain that God has created sex to operate so any sex outside of that relationship uh, is sinful now um, as has been adequately said and I'll quote Frank Turek on this you know fire is great when it's in the fireplace because that's the that's the place that you want it to burn but when it gets outside of the fireplace it's dangerous and it burns the house down and sex is the same way there's a place that God ordained sex to operate and it is only within um, a marriage relationship. And so notice that um, Constable says it refers to illicit sexual intercourse. Uh, the Greek word is pornea. Interesting, we get the word pornography from that, uh, an aspect of it. Um, but the, the point here is, is that um, as Christians, we shouldn't be involved in that. Now, you know, if this was uh, 50 years ago, it probably wouldn't be as much of an issue among Christians. 
unfortunately, in today's church, because fornication is rampant. I mean, look, people have always had sex outside of marriage. I understand that. But <clears throat> today, um, look, when I went to high school, I went to high school in the early 70s, you know. And it, look, people in, in high school were having sex with each other. Um, but not everybody. And not everybody was having sex with everybody else, okay? It wasn't like a free-for-all. And I went to a pretty good high school. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a pretty big high school. I don't know how good it was. It was a public school. But anyways, the, um, <clears throat> you know, things have changed. I mean, when I went to high school in the early 70s, um, there was a small group of people that did drugs. Everybody knew who they were. They were a little spacey. They were kind of out there. They dressed a little bit different. They were more, they looked more like hippies and stuff like that. Again, it was coming out of the 60s. But um you know, unfortunately, they kind of stereotype themselves, right? Um, you know, you fast forward to today, and there's only a small group of people in high schools probably that don't do drugs, because most do, okay? Um, you know, sex has become much more casual at a younger age. Um, you know, uh, I've, <clears throat> you know, I've talked to school teachers um, in uh, from public schools, and, um, you know, one was telling me that they had uh, two pregnant girls in sixth grade. I'll be honest with you, when I was in sixth grade, I didn't know how to get anybody pregnant. Uh, you know, that's kind of where I grew up. But, um, you know, I mean, the, these kids are doing things that are, you know, the, the, the sin has just been pressed down to a younger age, and kids are experiencing things much, much younger. The problem with that is, is that these young kids are learning it in the culture. They bring it into the church. Now, again, um, you know, if I had little kids right now, um, which I don't, but if I had little kids right now, um, you know, I may not be kind of clued into uh, what would be going on in their school because as an older adult, you know, I would be thinking, well, it was like when I was in high school. Well, it's not. It's I mean, it's a different galaxy. Um, the culture is entirely different. The viewpoints are different. Um, you know, they they had just taken the Bible out of schools and prayer in the 60s when I was going to grade school. And then things started to rapidly deteriorate. So now, again, you fast forward, um, uh, you know almost 50 years later, I mean, I graduated in 1975. So, you know, this is almost 50 years later. And look at us. I mean, um, you know, even many Christian communities, you would look at them. And if you didn't know any different, if somebody kind of, um, you know, could go back in a time machine and get somebody, you know, forward, from 50 or 100 years ago, they would probably look at a lot of Christians and think, well, they're not Christians. They don't even live like Christians. Um, because as the younger generation gets the world poured into them now through, um, I mean, the Internet, all kinds of social media, uh, everybody's online. This stuff just kind of the kids are bombarded with this stuff. I mean, they're, they're sexting, um, they're doing all kinds of stuff that they should not even be introduced to at the ages that they're dealing with it. And they come to church with their parents. Their parents don't know a lot of this is going on. And then, but they're growing up thinking that some of this is normal. Now, imagine um, if you were a Jew living in the Old Testament uh, during the times when the kingdom was split, right? You had 10 northern kingdoms, two southern kingdoms. You had all bad kings up north. All 20 of them were bad. Only eight were good down below in the south. And um, and so, you know, you're growing up and you're watching your parents. They go to the temple. Um, you know, other days during the week, maybe they go to the high places, uh, offer some sacrifice to Astoreth or Baal and... Um, you know, because that's kind of the practice uh, under some of even some of the good kings did not take away the high places. So, 
you know, you have these um, crazy orgies that are going on in these beautiful gardens up on these hilltops and all that. So you get all this kind of pagan worship being blended in with Judaism. Um, and as they were doing this, kids are growing up, they're watching this and they're thinking, well, that must be what it's like, like to be uh, a Jew. Right. So they follow the same thing. They follow their parents. Um, they kind of live this duplicitous life. They think it's OK as long as they're going to temple. You know, uh, they can do the high places. And that's, you know, that's kind of some fun partying um, for that, you know, that era. Uh, and so it's not like they had nightclubs or anything. So that would kind of double as a nightclub almost. And um, and so they're doing their thing. Well, the, the problem is, is that that infection, that spiritual infection was deteriorating the morality of the people they eventually ended up where in Babylon for 70 years because of their idolatry. Now, you know, you equate that to today in the church. And what you have is you have this um, this terrible immorality that is infecting young people. They're coming into the church they're growing up in the church. Like I say, many of the times their parents don't know it. Uh, sometimes their parents are off doing other things or they're, you know, maybe they're not really walking with the Lord or they just show up for church now and then, but they're not really invested. And then um, all of a sudden, you know, their kids start to go into their late teens or going off to college. And, you know, people are wondering, what, like, why is the kid not a Christian anymore? Why doesn't he believe right? Or, you know, he's into all this kind of immorality and everything else. And it's like, well, how did he get there? Well, he may have been doing it since he's been younger. But here's the other problem with it. As he's growing up and getting involved in youth group and then may even stay around and do some church ministry, he's bringing all that baggage that nobody even really may know that he's doing that he thinks is kind of okay into the church and you know and if if you want to set a standard within the church you're at to say hey you can't do this you can't do that or i mean um you can't be involved in ministry if you're going to be going out you know uh, acting crazy and, and doing some nutty things that are really sinful uh it's like well i you know and then they i'll go find another church that i can do that well and then they go off and do that um and then other churches will take them and let them live sinfully so that the numbers will go up. Um, you know, things have just deteriorated. And they're deteriorating because even though, you know, I could sit here, um, do this recording, talk about immorality, fornication, can talk about it from the pulpit. That doesn't mean that people are just going to stop it. People need to come to the place in their own life where the cross has an effect and they realize I'm a Christian. I am devoted and loyal to Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, not in this life anyways. Um, but it does mean that certain things, they're off limits. Fornication is one of them. Though the whole world is fornicating, it doesn't matter for us as Christians. Okay. And <clears throat> this is not, this is not difficult. I mean, you know, what I'm explaining to you is like Christianity 101. But if that's the case, what is the problem? Because the church is greatly affected, at least in America, um, with tremendous immorality. And it, it's, you know, the, the divorce rate among Christians is almost equal to the world. And the world has gone past 50%. So, um we're not moving the statistics in a sense in the right direction. So there's a problem. And, you know, so the, but the Bible addresses it. Okay. That's what Paul is doing here, right? He's saying, therefore, because you have this relationship with Christ, because everything is in Christ, because Christ is everything, he should be everything to us. Then, yeah, we should put these things to death. Now, that I have to put it to death. In other words, when he says, put to death your members, talking about the members of your body, you know, the, the things that make you sin, right? The ones that actually do the sinning, the pieces of your body, which are on earth, 
right? Um, we need to make a decision on that. That is something he, if that was automatic, he would not tell you to do it, right? In Romans 6, he says, we need to reckon, right? That's not an old cowboy term. That means to account. You, you need to consider and realize that um, these things need to be put to death, right? You reckon it dead. Here he's just saying, put it to death, right? Fornication. So we know what that is. Uh, uncleanness or impurity. You know, he gives you the Greek word um, in any form, especially moral impurity in this context. Passion or pathos is the Greek word, means uncontrolled, illegitimate desire. Um, in other words, we can have wrong passions. So when people say, oh, I really want to do that. It's in my heart, man. Well, does it line up with the truth? Hey, is it in your heart to jump off the building? Oh, I just really have this, you know, I mean, again, you know, go back to my era. Um, kids were, you know, they're taking uh, nosedives off of high buildings because they're on LSD. They thought they could fly. Well, the reality is they couldn't. OK, so it doesn't matter um, whether you want to do something because uh, you're artificially stimulated on a drug and it's just kind of moving you to do that, or whether it's because you're artificially stimulated, stimula easy for me to say, stimulated by thinking incorrectly. In other words, your thinking is not in line with the truth. Either way, it's not real. Uh, it's following a lie, and it is an uncontrolled, illegitimate desire, right? So, you know, the, the, the scriptures give us a boundary to operate for our desires and um, they, they can't go outside of those boundaries. Otherwise, we get ourselves in trouble. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. How about evil desire? Speaking of desires, right? It says means any evil desire in a more general sense, right? So um, it's translated evil desire in the New King James. Greed. Now, this is interesting because I actually sent off an email to some friends this morning when I was going through this. Greed is literally the desire to have more. Now, you know, we everybody understands greed, right? Um, any materialistic desire, right, including lust that disregards the rights of others. Now, notice this quote here. This really struck me when I was reading it. Um, it is the arrogant and ruthless assumption that all other persons and things exist for one's own benefit. So um, Constable's quoting that from uh, Card here, right? So I thought that was really interesting because, um, you know, as I've had to sit down with people over the years that have had, you know, substance abuse issues or whatever, Look, people can get addicted to anything, you know, um, <clears throat> drugs, alcohol, gambling, um, whatever. So there's a lot of things that people get kind of, you know, uh, addicted to. But what was interesting when I read this was, um, you know, many times when you when when people um, are very addicted to whatever it is, they burn a lot of relationships when they're when they're living their addiction or how, whatever you call it. Um, and, you know, for the drug addict, they, you know, they get up every day and they figure how do I, how am I going to get high today? Right. So they get to figure a way to get their drugs. People are people become a means to an end. They use people. Right. That's why, you know, they burn through their family members, they steal from them or whatever. They burn through their friends and everybody else. And eventually they, they hit the wall and go get help, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> same thing, you know, whether it's alcohol, gambling, right? Um, in other words, as I read this, I thought um, it becomes really the same thing. Greed can become the same kind of addiction, sinfully, like all these other things, because no matter what category you're dealing with, they all 
have this arrogant and ruthless assumption that everybody is there basically f to to serve them. You know, um, people are a means to an end. Um, look, I, I worked in the high tech industry, um, computers and, and all that stuff. I started with IBM in 1981. So uh, worked for them for like 12, 13 years and then uh, a few other companies before I came down here. And I mean, I watched this. I watched, um, you know, salesmen and others basically just um, because of their greed and their arrogance, uh, they basically just dealt with people as though they essentially were only there for their own benefit. Now, I'm not saying all salespeople are like that. We had some great salespeople in the different companies that I worked at, but uh, I was never a sales guy. I was always on the tech side. But um, my, my point is, is that when you start looking at people like that, uh, there's a problem. When pastors start looking at the congregation as dollar signs, that's this, that's greed. Um, when, when the gospel becomes about money, that's greed. Um, you know, and uh, look, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with Jesus, Peter, or Paul. Um, you know, they all deal with the fact that if money becomes the main feature of what you're doing as a ministry, now I'm not talking about, um, you know, mentioning an offering or, you know, if, um, you know, you know, I, look, I personally, you know, give to uh, some organizations that do some great work and all that, um, you know, they may let me know what their needs are, but, you know, they're not calling me every day and bugging me for money or anything. But the point is, is that um, if if people are just going after your wallet, you got to really question, you know, the legitimacy and have they got to the place of greed? Now, there's certainly tremendous need, you know, in um, in all Christian ministry and. Uh, but I think it's a I think it becomes a major problem. And I think it's part of the culture that is worked into the church to try to make it, um, you know, sanctified. Um, greed has become sanctified. And it's almost like a regular doctrine where people as people live as Christians, believing that the that Christianity is um, it is a belief system to get them wealthy. That is not the gospel. That is another gospel. Um, not to go into it at this point, but, you know, we're talking about greed. Um, so we need to, we just need to recognize, you know, what that's all about. Now, um, <clears throat> I thought it was interesting because he says covetousness or greed, right? It's translated covetousness in the New King James uh, over here. Which is idolatry? Now, when we were looking at um, last week, we went through what um, Barclay was saying, and he had some pretty good insight into this. Uh, let's see. He get. Um, I think I went too far. Hold on. Five, let's see. Picture closed, taking it off, like passage, blah, blah, blah. Um, Let me find it real quick here. So I paused the recording so I wouldn't waste your time when I look for it. But it was just right above where we're reading. And uh, so this is, again, this is the word for covetousness or greed. And he says, it's basically the desire to have more, which we read, right? He said the Greeks themselves defined it as uh, insatiate uh, desire and said that you might as well 
easily satisfy it is you might fill with water a bowl with a hole in it. In other words, you can't. Um, they defined it as the sinful desire for what belongs to others. It has been described as ruthless self-seeking. Um, its basic idea is the desire for that which man has no right to have. It is, therefore, a sin with a very wide range. If it is the desire for money, it leads to theft. If it's the desire for prestige, it leads to evil ambition. If it's the desire for power, it leads to sadistic tyranny. If it is the desire for a person, it leads to sexual sin. Um, C.D.F. Moole, he's another commentator, um, old guy, died years ago. But he says, um, he well describes it as the opposite of the desire to give. Now, he says, such a desire, says Paul, is idolatry. Well, how can that be? The essence of idolatry is the desire to get. So we're going to kind of bring this full circle. Uh, a man sets up an idol and worships it because he desires to get something from it. To quote Mool, idolatry is an attempt to use God for man's purposes rather than to give oneself to God's service. The essence of idolatry is, in fact, the desire to have more or to come at it another way. The man whose life is dominated by the desire to get things has set up things in the place of God. And that uh, precisely is idolatry. So if we jump back to the Old Testament again, when um, the pagans would worship, they would choose the uh, the God that they wanted. In other words, if they, you know, if they were into power, they would probably go after Baal. If they were into sex, they'd go after Ashtoreth. If, um, you know, if um, if they wanted, you know, to party, they'd go with Molech. I mean, there there was a God for every kind of sinful avenue, and that would be the God you worship. Now, um, that's really no different than you know, the world today, I mean, if, if somebody wants to worship power, sex, money, you know, uh, position, um, you know, status, whatever, um, you know, th they're, they're going to worship what they want to, even if it's violence. Okay. There's a lot of religions that, that uh, not a lot, but there's some that, uh, promote terrible violence. Um, well, you know, you have to want to be violent if you want to worship that God. So, th though they're not really gods, as you know. So, idolatry really, in a sense, is the worship of yourself. Because basically I'm saying, this is what I want to do. So, if I were God, then I would just want to do this. And, you know... Uh, you know, we're talking about greed or money. Let's 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 call it money. If if money was my God, then I would go, you know, um, or my desire, then I would go worship a God that promoted money. And then in doing that, what am I worshiping? I'm worshiping my own desires because ultimately that's what idolatry is. Um, you know, um, like he says, it's a desire to have more to come at it another way the the man whose life is dominated by the desire to get things has set up things in place of God. Now, that's for some form of, you know, materialism or whatever. But um, but that's really what idolatry is. You, you're you you've chosen to worship something that is really what you want. Now, Unfortunately, if you take those concepts and move them into Christianity and try to blend them in with the Bible, then you get a lot of this carnality that's in the church, a lot of the sinfulness and everything else. And, um, you know, and we've kind of come to the place where we're at today, at least in the American church, with a lot of problems because there's not, you know, look, there's many, many Christians that are walking with the Lord. They're they got great relationships and I'm sure God is well pleased with them. But there's also many that are just, 
you know, they're they're not really um, <clears throat> engaged properly with the truth of the Bible. Though they may like Christian music, they may they may like church, they may like a lot of the kind of church atmosphere, church people because they they're moral and figure they won't rip them off or whatever. And um, you know, um, but but the problem is they take this worldly baggage into the church. And then, unfortunately, the church many times accommodates it to keep them. And then that's how the truth gets watered down, as well as Christian experience, genuine Christian experience, because th there's a lot of different experiences Christians can have. So as we move on to verse 6, he says, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Well, that's pretty severe. I mean, wrath is anger, right? There's a couple of different words for anger, um, you know, in the New Testament. Let's see. Um, any of them giving it here real quick? Um, I bet uh, Wiest. Wiest is, uh, he used to teach Greek at uh, Moody Bible Institute. So let's see. Um Members, let's see. So verse 6, does he deal with wrath? Um, so nobody wants to define wrath. We'll, we'll go over to Vines, right? Since Vines is um, somebody that we go to. Let's see. Wrath. And notice we get two words, mainly, right? Um, orge and thumos, right? So um, orge is really typically anger. Thumos um, is like a hot passionate anger, basically. Um, and notice, uh, let's see. We have here King James Plus. So wrath is 3709, which is uh, orge. That's the word. So we go back to vines. And then, so we need to go to anger. Anger and notes number one and two. Let's see what he has to say. Originally, any natural impulse, desire, disposition... Uh, came to signify anger as the strongest of all passions. Use of the wrath of man, blah, 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 obviously. Now, <clears throat> here's the notes that I think are important. Thumos, wrath, not translated anger. That's important to know. It never is. Uh, is to be distinguished from orge in this respect. That thumos, look at the arrow over it. That doesn't help. Thumos indicates a more agitated condition of the feelings, an outburst of wrath from inward indignation, while orge suggests a more settled or abiding condition of mind, frequently with a view to taking revenge. Orge is less sudden um, in its rise than thumos, but more lasting in its nature. Thumos expresses more the inward feeling, orge the more active emotion. Uh, let's see. So, um, Thumos, we're down here. Thumos is found 18 times in the New Testament, 10 of which are in the Apocalypse, Book of Revelation, in seven of which the reference is to the wrath of God. So in Romans 2, 8, wrath, Thumos, indignation, orge, um, so let's see, the order of the King James is inaccurate. Everywhere else, the word thumos is used in a bad sense. Now, if we pop up here, we have Colossians 3, 6 that is referenced um, for the noun orge. So orge is giving us this kind of, you know, it's not a, like just responsive 
burst, but it's, uh, you know, people are storing up wrath, as it talks about in Romans 2. And this is, but, but it's because of this wickedness and this sinfulness that people are, are practicing. This is why the wrath of God is going to come uh, upon people that are in disobedience. So um, in verse 7, it says, in, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And that's true. I mean, look, remember, um, before we were Christians, many of us, you know, look, some, some people um, before they were Christians, they weren't terrible people. They didn't do terrible things. They just weren't saved. Some people did terrible things. Um, I was definitely on the other side of the tracks and uh, before I get saved. So I can understand living in them. Now, this word walked um, is, let's see, uh, perpeteo. So let's see what um, Vines has to say about that. Actually, what we can do, um, let's see if we can get... Um, So, as we look at it, at least in, in this one, anyways. So, why isn't that moving? Hold on one second. All right. All right, here we go. So, as we look at it here, verse 7, in which you also walked, right? Perpeteo, to walk. He says, C110, there is emphasis. And of course, we have to go to the... Uh, The next one. So, got one ahead there, wait a minute. All right. So, Vine says about walk, this, this, uh, Perpeteo, he says, uh, is used physically in the synoptic gospels, right? Figuratively sing signifying the whole round of activities of an individual life, whether unregenerate or believer. Uh, he does get down to, uh, does he reference, he doesn't reference Colossians 3 here. Um, 
However, in 37 watt is 4043, and that's what this is here. So, though um, Colossians 37, at least I don't see it there, it's not referenced. However, um, you know, it's the course of a person's life. I mean, if like it's it's essentially like what we do. So in verse eight, he says, but now you yourselves <clears throat> um, are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And then he goes on, you know, for uh, in verse Nine, he adds, don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, the former life, that, implying there has to be a change. And then verse 10, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now, the, um, you know, we'll pop through the definition of those words in verse 8. But when Paul is talking about the new man renewed, in other words, we're a new creation right, in 2 Corinthians 5. And it's, we're renewed in the knowledge according to that new one. In other words, that new creation. Um, the, the image of him being God who created him. In other words, we're, we are in the image of God, but we are in the new creation. Now, again, when I get saved, I was under Adam, and I, I got his nature, sinful nature. Um, I was born into Adam and then I move over into Christ by faith. So the head of the race I was born into was Adam, who was a sinner. The head of the race that I moved into by faith is Jesus Christ. God is making a whole new race of people that are made new in him, in Christ, right? So though we are, though the image of God is damaged under Adam, it's not damaged under Christ. And so, but we have to know that. We have to grow in that knowledge. And um, and we can't be renewed in that knowledge, you know, obviously, if we don't know what the Bible teaches. So, very, very important. Now, um, in verse 8, um, well, actually, since we're in Weast, he says, but now, says in effect, now that you've passed... Uh, from that life of sinful conduct, see that you strip yourselves of these vices. So that's a quote from expositors. Anger, which is, uh, again, orge, an abiding, settled, right, habitual anger um, for revenge. This is from a sinful standpoint. And let me say this, you know, God gets angry, we get angry. There are, you know, God has given us those emotions. We're made in God's image. Um so whether it's anger, joy, um, you know, having peace or whatever. In other words, we we can have anger after the sinful nature. We can have anger after the new man uh, nature. In other words, um, you know, I'm a partaker, Peter says, of the divine nature. So my anger, like Paul says in, in Ephesians um now I'm forgetting where it is. Ephesians 5, be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. And um, so that that's like a command to be angry. But but there are things that we are to be angry against, right? So um, God gets angry. Well, he gets angry righteously at the things that are wicked because of what they do to the people that he loves, right? He loves man these things destroy people's lives so he he hates them he's angry at them and um you know but if we get angry god's anger is going to be brought out in um taking vengeance in other words that is a righteous retribution for the wrongs that are done but many times we are angry you know like like Paul says in Romans at the end of Romans 12, we have to give place to wrath, right? Um, because, you know, a lot of our anger is a response um, just for revenge. Well, they did that to me and I'm going to do that back to them. They think they're getting away with that and we're going to get our pound of flesh. Well, th that's the, the Bible 
tells us not to do that, right? Um, you know, it's not, you know, tit for tat here. Um, you know, we need to kind of step back and realize, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I shouldn't be responding to everything after the old nature. But anyways, we have both of those words in this verse. So we have anger, which is orge. We have wrath, which is thumos, right? The boiling agitation of feelings and sudden violent anger. Malice, uh, malignity, ill will, desire to injure, right? I mean, you know, you, you watch some of these uh, social media things or, you know, these reality shows and it's filled with malice. Everybody wants to get back at everybody. It's unbelievable. I mean, not that I watch it, but it's like you see the commercials for it and it's like, why are people watching that stuff? Um, blasphemy means slander, right? Um, detraction, speech that's injurious to another's good name. Filthy communication is foul speaking or obscene language. So these are the things that we're still on the negative that Paul is saying to put away. Uh, verse 9, he says, don't lie to one another. I mean, that's, you know... Um, it's one of the commandments anyways. I mean, look, you can get nine of the Ten Commandments repeated in the New Testament. You don't get the fourth one, which is the Sabbath day, because that related to Israel as a nation. And um, it was a sign of the the Mosaic Covenant. It has nothing to do with the church. But, um, you know, so again, Wiest here says lie is present imperative. So present tense means continuous, imperative um, means it's a command. So forbidding the continuance of the action already going on. It is, in other words, stop lying to one another. Paul is basically assuming that they are, and he's saying, hey, you, you need to knock this off, right? These are Christians. He's telling them these things. These Colossian saints had carried over into the new life the sin of lying, uh, they should stop lying because they had put off the old man with his practices. Uh, that person they were before they were saved and had put on the new man, the person they were now in Christ Jesus. This new person being constantly renewed with respect to a complete and perfect knowledge, which is according to the image of the one who created him. Lightfoot says, which is ever being renewed unto perfect knowledge. Um the true knowledge in Christ, as opposed to the false knowledge of the heretical teachers, right? In this case, it's the Gnostics. Um, and again, we can listen to things that are lies and it would be, we could just put, you know, take Gnostic out and put something else in there. Um, we need to grow in knowledge, right? Peter says at the end of his epistle, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um you have to grow in knowledge, and that's knowledge of the truth, because you got to take the things that are not true out and replace it with truth. This this thing going on, this is replacement. I read the Bible, and you know, uh, doesn't have to be a big revelation. It can be like, oh, well, you know, um, I guess I, you know, I haven't really been thinking about that, and. I'm, I'm, I need to start practicing that. Well, I've taken something false out to put something true in, right? Um, you know, this is part of what happens as we study the Bible. So he says, regarding the reference uh, to the image of him that created him, the same authority offers this explanation. This reference, however, does not imply an identity of the creation here mentioned with the creation of Genesis, but only an analogy between the two. So he's make Paul's making a comparison. He's not talking about, um, you know, the Genesis creation. He says the spiritual man in each believer's heart is like a primal man in the beginning of the world was created after God's image. The new creation in this respect resembles the first creation. The pronoun him cannot refer to anything else than the new man, the regenerate man, right? So uh, the new birth was a recreation of God's image. The subsequent life must be a deepening of this image thus stamped upon the man. So that's the quote Weiss gives us 
Uh, this putting off of the old man and the putting on of the new man took place at the moment the Colossian sinner put his faith in Christ or the moment we did, right? So it's the same thing. Um, and again, um, putting off the old man, just like a jacket, take him off, right? Uh, you get to consciously do that. Uh, I'm not, you know, Lord, give me the strength. I don't want to lie anymore. Well, you stop lying by just telling the truth. Like Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Um, you know, the, the rest of it, he said, basically getting into sin. So in verse 10, he says, and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him created him. Verse 11, we'll end on this verse. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. Now, <clears throat> Paul made a similar um, comment to the Galatians talking about how these distinctions get lost in Christ. That does not mean they are not there because obviously the rest of the, the Bible addresses us as, um, um, you know, man, woman, um, Gentile, Jew. Uh, in other words, <clears throat> in Christ, the distinctions... Um, do not carry into our relationship with him. For example, I'm not close. If I'm a Jew, it, it it doesn't matter. I'm not. My genealogy has no effect on my righteousness in Christ. I mean, Paul even talked in Philippians three, um, you know, about his genealogy, saying he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Right? Um, it didn't matter. Right? Tribe of Benjamin. He said, I count it rubbish. And he was talking about dung, uh, you know, for righteousness in Christ. In other words, not having my own righteousness. So here, you know, he's effectively saying that, um, you know, that th these distinctions do not play into um, giving anybody an advantage in their relationship. If you are in Christ, you're in Christ. So <clears throat> let's see if we can get a quick comment on this verse because we're coming to the end of the time. Verse 11, what's McDonald get to tell us? Uh, differences of nationality, religion, culture, social level are not the things that count. As far as standing before God is concerned, all believers we on the same level in the local church fellowship. This same attitude should be adopted. This does not mean, right, that there are no distinctions in the church. Some have the gift of evangelist, pastor, teacher, right? Some are elders, some are deacons. Uh, the, the, thus, the verse does not disparage proper distinctions. Neither should the verse be taken to teach that distinctions listed have been abolished in the world. Uh, such is not the case. There is still Greek and Jew, like I said, uh, Greek here standing for the Gentile peoples. There are the circumcised and uncircumcised. These two expressions are generally used in the New Testament to describe Jew or Gentile respectively. However, um, here they might refer more particularly to the ritual itself as practiced by the Jewish people and disregarded by the Gentiles. There is still, right, the barbarian, the uncultured person, uh, and the Scythian. These two expressions are not set in contrast to one another. Scythians were barbarians, um, but were generally considered to be more extreme. Um, they were the wildest and most savage of the barbarians. The final contrast is slave and free. Free refers to those who had never been in bondage, but were born free. For the Christian, these worldly distinctions are no longer of importance. It is Christ who really counts. He is everything to the believer and every uh, to the believer and in everything. He represents the center and uh, circumference of the Christian's life. Now, again, people can take these verses, distort them, saying, 
oh, see, like there's there's no gender identity. There's no man or woman. Uh, that's not, you know, that's not what it means, um, because Paul adds that over in Galatians. But th that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about if I get saved, you know, two minutes ago or I got saved, you know, 50 years ago. I am in Christ equally. I have an equal relationship before God because I have the same righteousness. Jesus doesn't give more righteousness to one person when they get saved than another. If you are in the body of Christ, if you are born again into the body, you're a Christian. You have the same position before God, regardless of your level of maturity, um, you know, or your knowledge or whatever. None of that matters in that respect however the goal as paul is telling us here is to grow in maturity which is getting rid of the sinful life the life that we came out of the old man and moving into the life of the new man in christ that's where god wants us to walk that's where he's pleased with us um now he's pleased with me positionally because he sees the righteousness of christ but you know in my my performance i can do things that displease god so i need to be careful about that um my attitude you know the the things that i'm saying the things that i'm doing we need to be very careful about that but this is where paul gets into the application portion and the next section starts in the next therefore uh in verse 12 so until we reach the next therefore until next time may god richly bless you as you continue to study his word.